What I want to do today is kind of take us back a little bit. So a little bit of history and then bringing us full circle to where we are now. A lot of things that have already been discussed. And so we're going to start with politics of violence against women from horseback to running backs. And the purpose of this picture, some of you have maybe already seen this picture in the light of the Ray Rice scandal that's been going on. And this is where we're going to end with today. But what I want to do is talk a little bit about the po the, the politics of violence against women all the way back in the colonial period, briefly, and then bring us forward to um, the Violence Against Women Act, the, the fact that it took so long to reauthorize and was so incredibly partisan to reauthorize in 2012, and then what Congress is doing now to continue to politicize the issue of violence against women with what's been going on in the NFL. Excuse me, in the NFL. So in the olden days, we go back to the 1640s. So we're talking colonial period, before the Declaration of Independence, before we've broken away from Britain, when we have home rule. So all the colonies are able to basically set their own sort of mini constitutions and sets of laws for themselves. Massachusetts is the first state or colony back then to come and say, we're actually going to have some type of law against violence against wives. Okay, so back then, it's very specific in talking about the relationships between husbands and wives what husbands can and can't do against their wives, okay? And so if we look at the language here, again, every married woman shall be free from bodily correction or stripes by her husband unless she deserves it, unless she initiates something. And so even, even when we have this first little piece that's to protect married women from abuse from their husbands, it still says, but, you know, if he's being, if it's in his own defense, then it's okay. But of course, we don't know exactly what that means, right? And this will come up again with Ray Rice and his fiance, now wife. Did she come at him first in the elevator, so therefore she deserves to get knocked out on the floor, right? And dragged out of the elevator, okay? Which we'll talk about in a little bit. When we move through the colonial period, we move through the 1700s, we move through the 1800s, there are a couple of court cases that come about that deal with the issue of domestic violence. And all of them basically say, if a husband perpetrates something like this against his wife, there are some kind of penalties that they will see. And mostly these are physical penalties that the husband will um, have to deal with. It's nothing like going to jail, but it's being flogged, for example. So if you are convicted of beating your wife, you get flogged. You don't go to prison, but you do get beat up by other men. So even here we see that there's a difference between protecting a woman from being hurt by somebody by the law and that the person that perpetrates that has some kind of long-term consequence or just saying, okay, we're just going to beat you up a little bit and then you can go home. And this takes us all the way in until really the 1970s. And we're going to get to that in just a little bit. But it's, it's interesting to think about a man beats up a man, somebody's going to jail, right? A man beats up his wife, gets flogged, hurts for a little while, you move on with your life. Where's the protection of the woman, right? No federal legislation, okay? In 1906, the first discussion of some kind of piece of federal legislation to protect women, particularly married women against their husbands, it's first introduced and it gets nowhere. And so clearly we see that the federal government has zero interest in making this a political issue, and it's still considered to be something at the state and really local and sometimes county level. Where we move to is the 1960s. So there's a, a lot of turmoil, there's a lot going on. Dr. Caliendo showed us some really powerful images of what's happening, um, particularly in the civil rights movement. And what rises out of the civil rights movement eventually and slowly is the feminist movement, right? That's a very oversim oversimplified discussion of it. But as we, before we get into sort of the height of the feminist period, we see a switch in the 1960s and early 70s. Domestic violence, it's not a legal issue. It's a family issue. It's not a political issue. It's not a criminal issue. This is a family situation. If you're getting beat up by your husband, you need to deal with it within your family. Cops aren't going to be there to support you. There's no, no county organization or sort of larger linked types of organizations that are going to help you. And in fact, there were discussions had with police officers and things written in their manuals to say, arrest with domestic violence is absolutely the last resort. We don't want to see arrests of husbands beating on their wives. Maybe sometimes it's the reverse of that, but usually not. 
We want to encourage you as a family to take care of it on your own. Only arrest at the last possible minute, at the last possible resort. So this, of course, is incredibly frustrating and is exposed in a book called Battered Wives. I don't know if anyone has heard of this book before. Maybe some faculty around here that have heard of this book by a woman last name Del Martin. She writes this book in the 1970s, and it, it just cracks open this discussion of domestic violence. Right? We had no idea as a nation on a large scale the amount of violence that was being perpetrated against women, and in particularly against wives, and the fact that they had nowhere to go. They had no protection under the law, so to speak, right? No federal legislation for sure. No one in Congress is talking about this. Presidents aren't talking about it. The wives themselves are not talking about it. Because what, where, what are they gonna do? Where are they going to go? This book is published, and this is at the rise of the feminist movement, and all of a sudden, a discussion begins in the late 1970s and early 1980s about the epidemic of domestic violence. So that's a good thing, a good discussion to begin, but it still sort of stays stagnant for a while. And even with the feminist movement and all that it does and all that it pushes forward for women, we're still not getting a national dialogue. There is not, as Dr. Kellinda was talking about, there's not a face of a victim we can relate to, right? Maybe you're a victim yourself, but you're too afraid or ashamed to talk about it. Maybe your neighbor's getting beat up, but you don't know. There's nobody that we can relate to in terms of a victim that makes it real for us. So we move along through the 1980s. Nothing really happens. 1994, the O.J. Simpson case. Some of you were not born yet? Maybe. <laughs> Some of us were very aware of this case. Um, what happens in 1994 with the O.J. Simpson case, and a lot of what's been discussed with Ray Rice more recently, has been linked to the O.J. Simpson case. So for those of you that are unfamiliar, O.J. Simpson was one of the best running backs in the history of the NFL. Okay? Um, that's what he was known for, for. That and also being in Avis commercials and running through airports. Right? See, my like four people know what I'm talking about, running over the suitcases in airports. Um, he's married to um, a white woman, and this is a little bit important as well, we talk about racial implications, O.J. Simpson, African-American, married to a white woman, living in this beautiful community in California. They get divorced, and they have children together. Um, she has a friend, a male friend at her home, and allegedly he goes over there and he murders them both and then takes off in the white Ford Bronco down the highways of LA, and it's all over the TV. The chase of the Ford Bronco interrupts every news broadcast, or every TV show on that night to watch the white Bronco with O.J. Simpson just like trucking down the LA highways, okay? So some of you may already know he's eventually acquitted for the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, but what it does do is finally put a face to domestic violence, a face of a woman who's been murdered by somebody who is beloved across the country, that all of a sudden we think, well, if that can happen to her by that person, maybe this is something we need to be discussing. If we were right about four years before that, Joe Biden, who we all know now as Vice President, or Uncle Joe, like I like to call him, um, he starts writing a piece of legislation. He's a senator then. The Violence Against Women Act. Starts writing this in 1990. So this is four years before this happens, okay? Starts writing it, and he's working with feminist organizations, with women's groups, he's working with members of Congress to finally put into place some large-scale piece of federal legislation to protect women from this and worse. So once 1994 happens, once O.J. Simpson is... Um, uh, is, is put on trial for killing Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, Uncle Joe says, I think this is my chance. We have a victim, a face of a victim, at the hands of someone that we know and we love. Now I think we have a chance to actually get some kind of attention to this issue, and let's politicize it. And I don't mean that in a negative way. It's not, a, 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 it's not a, in a way to exploit but it's a way to make progress, right? Often with politics, it's what we see. Something happens, something awful, tragic happens. Someone decides to take advantage of the situation to make some kind of progress. And this is what Joe Biden does. 
Now, we've just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Violence Against Women Act. And so he talks, this is an old picture of him, and this is a quote from more recently, but he goes down here at the bottom, and he talks about the changing culture that happens with the passage of the Violence Against Women Act. That for the first time, finally, as a nation, we're changing our perception of what it means to be a victim of domestic violence and of the protections that you should have if you are a victim of domestic violence. And in particular, this idea of, and it's important here, he says, it became part of our political culture that in that it gained acceptance. So it's OK to talk about this now. And not only is it OK to talk about it, but we're going to talk about it a lot. And we're going to expect members of government to talk about it. And we're going to expect the federal government to take care of it. It's now embedded in our politics, for good or for ill, right? He would say for good because it passes, right? Now, it passes overwhelmingly, OK? Now, for, for any of you who may know how the process of legislation works, the reason I put this up here, it passed under suspension of the rules in the House of Representatives. So what that means is 20 minutes of debate time, no amendments added, and 2 thirds of the House has to vote on it, has to vote yes. Um, does that ever happen? No. And on, an, on a piece of legislation as large scale as this, and might I add that the, the Violence Against Women Act of 94 is a smaller part of a larger piece of legislation. Um, it flies through the House, which again, like, never happens. And as you can see here, it flies through the Senate. Same thing happens in 2000 when it's reauthorized and 2005 when it's reauthorized. No problem. Bipartisan support. Who doesn't love a bill called the Violence Against Women Act, right? Who doesn't love a bill called that? Because how do you come out against, you don't like violence, we don't like violence, right? We don't like violence against women, so how would you come out against that? So we have to ask the question, when it's up for reauthorization in 2012, why does it take 13 months for it to be reauthorized? Why is that the case? If it flew through the first three times, why all of a sudden is it such a problem? Well, we have to ask ourselves a question. Is Congress playing politics? That's what they do. 2012, we're in an election year, both congressional and presidential. Is this an opportunity to play politics with women who are getting beat up by people, stalked by people, raped by people? Is this an opportunity? Well, some people thought so. Jeff Sessions, who's a Republican senator from Alabama, he comes out in this famous quote and he says, I've supported this bill before, but there are things in this new version I can't get on board with. And I kind of think I know why they're in there. It's all strategy on the part of the Democrats to force Republicans to vote no, which makes us look like we are wife beaters ourselves. This pits Republicans in a corner that they're not very comfortable. In an election season where the war on women has already been ramping up, you have a lot of Republicans who are very uncomfortable with certain things in this particular new Violence Against Women Act. In particular, the inclusion of protections of same-sex couples, the inclusion of a provision where undocumented immigrants who are being abused could get temporary visas to stay, um, and also some provisions on what happens on Native American reservations, particularly non-Native Americans who commit acts on an, a Native American reservation. Per and in particular, the same-sex couples um, component of the bill is very bothersome to Republicans. And so we battle, we battle, we battle for 13 months. Finally, this version with these inclusions passes on a straight party-line vote. Not a single Republican votes for it. But there were enough Democrats that were able to vote for it. They were able to figure out a way to do it. Uh, in, the, in, in the Senate, I should say. Things looked a little different in the House. Well, is Congress still doing this? Okay, we got through the Violence Against Women Act, it's reauthorized. Is Congress still playing politics with violence against women? Is Ray Rice's New Jersey, for anybody who's interested? Since he's not in the NFL anymore, puts on his wife beater, this is New Jersey. Most of you have probably seen this video, but if you haven't, I would like you to take a quick look at it. There's Ray Rice. And that's his fiance, Janae Palmer, who's his now wife. They're in a casino in Atlantic City. 
See how things would be different if that lady just walked right into that elevator? Mm -hmm. How th different things may have turned out? So this is one of the more controversial components of it. And there it is. He knocks her out cold. She is unconscious in the middle of an elevator. He's trying to figure out what to do next. Kind of shakes her. Okay, she's knocked out. Drags her out of the elevator. And he's trying to figure out what to do now. So there's a lot of things obviously very disturbing about this video. The punch to the face, of course. But does this look like a woman whose rights are being upheld? Does this look like a woman who um, is, feels, feels safer, is protected, right? The NFL says no. Uh, excuse me, the Congress says no. The NFL says, we're going to suspend you for two games, see what happens. Oh, wait, now we see the video, you're out, right? We know this big backlash against Roger Goodell. So what happens is we've got members of Congress that write a letter to Roger Goodell and say, here's how we think you should handle this issue. And in particular, they reference the Violence Against Women Act. It's 20 years since it was first passed. I think we really need to, to be thoughtful about how we are addressing these issues in a sport that is so high profile. And if you go up to the beginning, it actually talks a little bit about the economics of the NFL and its importance to our culture. A lot of components here. This letter goes to Roger Goodell. Senator Kristen Gillibrand, who's been um, at the forefront, particularly of military uh, violence against women, basically says, we as members of government, we as members of Congress, we are begging you, Commissioner Goodell, for a zero tolerance policy against this. He never ever should set foot on a field again. He should have been suspended immediately. She's going on like Meet the Press and the big morning shows where they talk about real important political issues, and this is becoming one of them. And after that, we've got four, 16 female senators, all but four that are in the Senate, who are also calling on Roger Goodell to incorporate this no-tolerance policy. So when we come back around to the beginning, and I leave you with this thought, and I know I'm a little over time, and I do apologize for that, um, we have to think about where we started and where we are. Yes, we've had improvements. Yes, these you know, women who were not originally written into the Constitution are now slowly being included into the Constitution and into the political culture and, in, and being protected. But I want us to think about how different things are now in terms of protections than they were from, horse, from horseback to running back. All right, so thank you guys very much. Again, I appreciate it. I'm sorry I was over time. I get excited.